since the dawn of civilization, wherever it started. Some say civilization started in ancient Sumeria, some say Egypt, some say India, and others believe it was the Hyperboreans. But wherever it started, that was where the first real state came into existence. Before this, people were hunter-gatherers who lived off the land and rarely stayed in one spot. Tribes were small and isolated and didn't interact with other groups very much. And if they did, it was often to kill each other. But this all changed with the agrarian revolution. You needed large groups of people working together to tend the fields and aqueducts. Otherwise, everyone would starve. When the state didn't keep tight control on its inhabitants, people became more loyal to their families or whatever groups they belonged to rather than to the state. Since if local loyalties were stronger than state loyalties, production would be thrown into chaos since people will put local interest ahead of state interest, which in turn makes it extremely difficult to orchestrate large projects like aqueducts. Since the state's inception, it has tried countless different methods of settling mobile populations and making them loyal. And over the course of thousands of years, especially the last few hundred years, states have gotten very good at settling populations and having them work towards their interests. But how was this done? Well, for the state to get what it needed, it had to know quite a bit about the people it governs. Up until recently, it used to be extremely difficult for administrators to collect taxes or even just identifying its citizens, since there were no good metrics for doing so. Towns had different units of measurements. They would measure distance in inexact terms like a stone's throw or within earshot. People didn't say how many acres they owned. It was measured by if they could grow enough food to get through the winter. Since Irish farmers used a lot of cow products, they would say they have a farm of one cow or a farm of two cows, indicating how many grazing cows their land could support, which depends on the quality of land and not of the acreage owned. To them, Measuring in acres is about as useful as telling someone how many pounds of books you bought. Even ways of identifying people could be completely different from village to village, so it was impossible for the state to get any useful metric when the hundreds of towns it governs use different and inexact ways of measurement. You can't get good numbers when one town says it owns a hundred stones throw of land and the next town says it owns enough land to support 50 cows. But over the last few centuries, this bug has been worked out, since we have standard units of measurements for weight and land ownership, and it's much easier to have information about the lives of average citizens since the widespread use of last names. The standardization of measurements actually had a lot of popular support when it was first introduced. In France, local nobles would sometimes take advantage of inexact measurements, since the metric used may have been something like one basket of wheat they could lend out a small basket of wheat to someone, but demand a larger basket in return, without technically breaking the agreement. But the introduction of the metric system forced uniform standards. Using metrics such as kilograms made it much harder to jip people. Before the standardization of measurements, governments had to collect taxes in different ways, since, unlike today, they can't just look at public records to see who owns what. For example, during the 1600s, the French government made its money by having fees for licenses, or through selling an office or title, through having excise taxes, and having crossing tolls. These forms of taxation were easy to administer, and required very little information about land owning or how much income one made. But during the 1700s, France tried to add a land holding tax, and it was about as effective as a YouTuber apology video. The historian James Collins found out that most of the time, the property tax was not paid at all, and even the few who did pay the tax never paid more than a third of what they were assessed for. So the French government, in order to pay for its military campaigns, had to get money elsewhere. They forced people to give them loans, saying they would pay them back later, which they often did not honor, or forced civilians to quarter soldiers in their homes. This was such a problem at the time, this literally became the Third Amendment in the US Constitution, even though today, it seems a little silly. But since so much more information is known about the average citizens by today's governments than the 1700s French government, it does not need to force loans or quarter soldiers in people's houses. The state always has some sort of way to raise revenue, whether by increasing taxes, which becomes ever harder to avoid paying since governments and corporations have so much more information about you, or by simply printing more money. 
Governments' monetary systems used to use precious metals in their coins like gold, so the government couldn't just print more money. But since we got off the gold standard in the 70s, the US dollar is now backed by trust in the US government. The state isn't more involved in just the collecting of taxes, the state now does much more. It designs our sewage systems, our road layouts, gives us medical care, and so on and so forth. But the state, thinking it knows a lot about its citizens, and thinking it knows what's best, has killed tens of millions of people over the last 100 years. Even if the failures of state planning don't directly kill people, they can easily lower its citizens' quality of life, even when they are trying to do something seemingly benevolent. Why though? Why? Because top-down planning almost always oversimplifies the extremely complex and nuanced environment it's trying to tame, which is exactly what happened to the forests of Germany during the 18th century. The early modern European state saw the forest not as a habitat, but as a natural resource to be exploited, even before there was an effective scientific way of managing the forest. But during the 18th century, Prussia and Saxony figured out scientific forestry and finally had a good way to organize and control timber production from the top down. Timber was vital for the functioning of the economy. It was used to make ships, houses, mills, chopping blocks, tools, etc. So maximizing its production is a no-brainer. But to do this, the old type of forests, the naturally occurring forests had to become more easily manageable. One of the first ways of doing this was a strategy pioneered by a man named Joanne Gottlieb. Assistants were given color-coded nails corresponding to five different categories of tree sizes. After going through a plot of land and subtracting how many nails they had left and of what color from the total they started with, they got a count of how many valuable trees were on the plot of land. But still, it wasn't very efficient. To cut down the trees, they had to get around all of the other useless trees and foliage to get to the useful species of trees like the Norway spruce. But managing something as complex as an entire forest ecology all at once was impossible and inefficient. So the logical way forward is to focus on maximizing the production of the forest's valuable products. So getting rid of all the pests, vermin, and trash became necessary. The many actual uses of the tree soon got replaced by an abstract tree that only represented its monetary value. The chaotic and wild old forests soon got replaced by neatly arranged rows of trees that were very easy to map out and were geometrically pleasing. They were turned into an administrative grid. You didn't even need to see the forest to know what it looked like. All you needed was a map. It became so much easier to predict lumber yields, and training new workers was super easy. They just had to follow a few simple protocols and they could harvest trees from about every other scientific forest in Germany. They became the epitome of neatness and order. All of the underbrush of these manicured forests were removed, fallen sticks hauled off, which in turn drove away the local bug and mammal populations. Local peasants trying to forage were seen as a nuisance. The first rotation, which takes about 80 years or so, was a huge success. The economic return on forests greatly improved. It was much easier to cut down and replant every rotation, and it provided a much more stable domestic supply of wood. The German model was so successful, it became the standard taught in schools around the Western world. French, British, and American forestry schools were based off these German models. These scientific forests were very utilitarian, but in a very narrow sense. The only important measure to a state or corporation is of monetary utility. But to the utilitarian naturalists, the state's very narrow frame of reference was actually extremely inefficient. The naturalist knows the forest has much more to offer than just the Norway spruce or elm tree. It is great for hunting, gathering, fishing, refuge, beauty, etc. The very narrow frame of monetary utility took nearly a hundred years to show its consequences. What is typical with top-down planning is that it only looks at a few variables since, well, it has to. A certain level of abstraction is needed to understand almost anything. Think of what an atom looks like. The image that just came to your mind probably looks something like this, which is an extremely oversimplified abstraction. An atom is illustrated like this to make it legible and easier to understand, since if you increase the size of an atom to make it visible to the naked eye, it would look more like this, 
and this is still a great simplification. In reality, it really wouldn't look like anything, so we need some way to make it legible, otherwise it's incomprehensible. Much like how the 18th century scientific foresters looked at the forest. They made simple, less chaotic plots of forest, so it was easier to map and manage. But by reducing something as complex as an entire forest ecology, down to a very narrow bracket of economic interest, they ignored all of the complex relationships that each plant, animal, insect, bird, shrub, dead trees, lizards, bacteria, and more has with each other and how important they are for the soil quality and just the general toughness of the forest. After the second rotation of trees, it was soon realized the trees' site classes, which was the metric used to grade the quality of timber, dropped by one to two points, which meant a lowering of production by 20 to 30 percent. A new term was coined by the Germans, Waldsturben, which meant forest death. The complex process of soil building, nutrient uptake, and symbiotic relationships between the species, which to this day are still not super well understood, was spelugied into a yugi, i.e. it was greatly disturbed. Forests were much weaker. Any pest that was good at destroying a Norway spruce or some other valuable tree had an all-you-can-eat buffet in these monocropped forests. They were much less resilient to storms, diseases were widespread, the trees had almost no defense compared to an unkept natural forest. The only reason the first two rotations grew so well was that it was living off of the wealth that was built up in the dirt before the scientific forest. But after all of this wealth was depleted, the forest started dying off. When this was realized, the foresters tried to remedy this by developing the science of forest hygiene. Instead of dead trees, they put specially designed boxes to try to bring back woodpeckers. They cultivated ant colonies and had local school children tend to them, and brought back many other species of animals to try and fix the problem. The results were mixed, and the German states never saw the same success they had during the first two rotations of trees. Okay, what's the point of this story? I just talked about trees like some pothead hippie for five minutes. There is a point, I promise. The point is about the dangers of reducing an incredibly complex subject, like a forest, and breaking it down to just one or two areas of interest. They may have impressive short-term results, but over the long term, the consequences can become disastrous due to oversimplifying an extremely complex and nuanced environment. A literal example of missing the forest for the trees. The way a government views its citizens is not much different from the way a scientific forester examines the forest. And not because the state is inherently incompetent or evil, but because it has to, to make management of its citizens comprehensible. If the state knows its limits and acts properly, the state can do great things for its people. It can help the poor and increase the quality of life. But it can also become the reason why the 20th century is considered the bloodiest century in history. The way an extremely dangerous state that's hostile towards its own people comes in four steps. The first step is the ordering of nature, like what the Germans did with the forest industry. That was the first step that led into all of the democide of the 20th century. But the ordering of nature can be used for good or evil. But this is a necessary step since it's nearly impossible to try to plan an outright new society without a certain level of industrial production. It's a lot easier for a state that has a military with tanks and machine guns with a large surveillance system than a state who can only use swords and horses to try and plan a new society. But of course, a hostile state requires a few more steps. The second step I'll just call a high modernist worldview, which is essentially a worldview that says science and progress will solve all of our problems, the deification of science, treating science as a faith and not as a method of discovery that can sometimes be wrong. Being unscientifically optimistic and oversimplifying the world into simple, easy to digest, abstract maps. Science and progress were the reasons why the peasant classes in communist countries had to be moved off of their independent or local farms and onto collectivized farms, since the science said this was the most efficient path to utopia. The third step is for a state with enough control to bring these high modernist ideas into reality, usually during times of trouble like wars economic depressions, revolutions, social collapses, or any time the population is going through something rough. Leaders with utopian or revolutionary ideas get into power and delegitimize the previous regime, 
like how someone as insane as Mao Zedong was able to rule China, since China was being invaded by Japan while also in the midst of a civil war. China was in great turmoil, and people were desperate to try to bring back stability, and enough people apparently thought that Mao Zedong would help them. Well, we know how that turned out. The fourth and final step is a population that can't resist, whether it's an economic hardship, or the society is experiencing a mental or spiritual crisis, the population can't mount an effective resistance, even if they know what is occurring is bad. But sometimes, they are so desperate that they will try any scheme that sounds like it might fix the situation, since they have nothing else to turn to, regardless of how insane the solution may be. The stuff that happened in China and Russia during the 20th century are the worst case scenarios, and the most destructive way the state oversimplifies the management of its population. But even seemingly benevolent and less intrusive state attempts to make life better for its citizens can backfire because they still only look at a few variables like economic improvement, or improving a citizen's quality of life. Even governments in the United States and Europe do this. although usually to a lesser extent than, let's say, a communist or a fascist country. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say the reason why the United States does not have walkable cities isn't because the American government is less competent than Europe's, but because most European cities existed and were well developed before cars were invented. This is like one of the first things a Redditor will bring up when criticizing the United States, that there are no walkable cities and everything is car-centric. I actually agree with the Redditors on this, but for different reasons. Redditors bring this up as the start of a general critique of American incompetence in general, but I would like to argue that the lack of walkable cities in the US is because of bad timing. Europe had been civilized much longer than the United States. The earliest colonial cities in America came around during the 1600s and was much more sparsely populated than Europe. Many European cities had been around for thousands of years and were much further along in their development so they never had to worry about designing cities around cars. America was in its infancy when cars started to become a thing, so only a few cities were around before cars. Here's an 1893 illustration of Jacksonville, Florida, considered one of the least walkable cities in the United States. Notice how every street is designed in a symmetrically, geometrically pleasing way. Every plot of land is either a square or a rectangle, making it a great place for a Costco or a parking garage but it's usually terrible if you want to walk anywhere. Since this naturally creates districts for things like shopping or residential areas, therefore everything is far apart, so the places where people live are not intermingled with grocery stores and restaurants. This is not how cities naturally form. These roads were planned and built by civil engineers and did not organically come about. Here is one of the oldest paintings of a town's layout. This is Bruges in Belgium, and it's dated at around the year 1540. Notice how non-geometric everything is. It's full of twists and turns. It was clearly not a top-down plan project like Jacksonville. No room for a Bucky's or a Walmart anywhere. Looking at the newer parts of European cities, they don't look much different than Jacksonville. Lots of symmetry and geometrically pleasing roads designed by top-down planning. Maybe Europe's newer areas are designed better than the United States is. I don't know for sure. But America's most walkable cities are places like New York, Philadelphia, Washington DC, San Francisco, which are some of the older cities in the US, and were fairly far along in their development before the widespread use of cars in those cities. So cities didn't need to be planned around the use of them. So I think I can say on good authority that the biggest reason why Europe has more walkable cities is not because of more competent urban planners, but because most of their cities were established before the invention of cars, and therefore needed little or no top-down planning. Since cars started to become widely used during the late 1800s and early 1900s, the urban planners looked at one variable, how to make cities better for cars, since faster travel means more efficiency, which means people can buy stuff more conveniently, therefore encouraging business. Completely ignoring all of the negative side effects roads bring, they didn't consider things that can't be measured quantitatively, like how it would destroy smaller communities since local mom and pop shops will be run out of business since everyone can just drive to a Walmart that's 10 miles away, therefore destroying small town autonomy and indirectly forcing everyone to buy a car, and how now walking in the city is very unpleasant. But since roads are economically efficient, that took precedent over everything else when designing a city, just as in the case of scientific forestry in 18th century Prussia. 
the only factor was the economic value that the forest or road provided, and nothing else. The disastrous long-term effects were unknown or just straight up ignored. This is exactly what the McNamara fallacy is. The overfocusing of quantitative data and ignoring the qualitative data. The guy this term is named after, Robert McNamara, was the US Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War. He had the typical accountant phenotype. I mean, just look at him. Of course he's gonna love numbers and mathematical data. But numbers and data were the only things he looked at. On paper, it looked like the Americans were winning the war. I mean, yeah, they were, if you only looked at the body count and areas occupied. But the actual situation was much different. Things that couldn't be measured on paper, like troop morale or the feelings of the average Vietnamese citizen towards the war. These things can't be measured quantitatively, so McNamara didn't include these things in his war analysis. The American troop morale was at rock bottom, and the average Vietnamese started to dislike the Americans more and more. And eventually, the war ended with the Americans suffering a humiliating defeat, even though quantitatively, the Americans should have won. Just because something is quantifiable doesn't mean that it's the most important factor, or that it's even an important factor at all. It's an easy mistake to make, and it's a mistake that the planners of the city of Brasilia made. By the end of the 1800s, it would have been difficult to not think that scientific planning of everything would not bring better results. To live through this time and see the clear-cut material advantages that industry and science had brought to the Western world would make anyone believe that man has finally become a god and will eventually be able to exercise complete control over the material world. Vastly improved cotton and textile production, better and stronger metals, the steam engine, the price of almost all commodities continuing to decline, the invention of electricity, etc, etc, all within the span of a hundred or so years. But why stop at material improvements? Why not, instead of just making commodities cheaper by scientifically improving production or inventing quicker ways of transportation, how about we try to design every little aspect of a person's life in a scientific way? For their own good, of course. Kingdom standardizing measurements during the 1700s wasn't just to make sure that people weren't getting ripped off when trading baskets of grain, it was also about unifying larger and larger populations together. The logic and rationalization that was previously applied to the forest was getting closer and closer to being applied to human society. The state's goals started changing. The state's activities before used to be about increasing its own wealth and power, increasing the skills, health, wealth, etc. of its population may have helped them raise taxes but this was usually a smaller goal, and the state was usually content letting its citizens fend for themselves. Since, even if they wanted to help, it's hard to get a good measure of who needed help in the first place when every town had its own unit of measurements and no method of instant communication. This made communication from village to the king very slow. But by the 1900s, the welfare of the population was not seen as a means to increase national strength, but as the end goal itself. Instead of the social order just being a given, the state now had enough power to manipulate and alter society at a scale never seen before, and could be more involved in its citizens' day-to-day -day life than ever, literally designing a city's culture and layout from the ground up. So far, the closest we have ever gotten to an entirely planned city would be the capital of Brazil, Brasilia. Brasilia was a project by Juscelino Kubitschek, the president of Brazil from 1956 to 1961, who promised 50 years of progress in five. It was supposed to be a city from scratch, with no ties to a tradition, culture, or history. The city's architects were high modernists to the core, people like Le Corbusier, whose style was used, and the chief architect, the communist Oscar Niemeyer, who took inspiration from the beautiful architecture of the Soviet Union. Like the maps used for scientific forestry and modern road planning, everything was designed to be geometrically pleasing, with lots of straight lines and right turns. Stuff that's easy to map out. The city was designed to have a district for only one purpose. A was for the plaza, B was for the religious areas, C was for the residential zones, where everyone lived in these buildings called the super quadras, D was for the president's house, and E was for the single-family homes. The things people needed for happiness became an equation. Things like air, heating, lighting, 
child care, education, recreation, health care, restaurants, shopping centers, and even personal space weren't decided by the people who lived there, but by the chief architects. And by the way, Lake Corbusier believed 14 meters of space per person was what everyone needed. The city was its own entity, paying no homage to the history or traditions of Brazilians. It's almost like the architects had a disdain towards Brazilian culture, and its residents could feel it. Streets in Brasilia weren't places where people walked by neighbors or strangers. They were exclusively used for cars, no sidewalks at all. It was nothing like the lively streets back in the lightly planned cities in the rest of Brazil. Like everything else, socializing had its own designated spot. To meet people, you had to go to this big empty nothing of a plaza called the Three Towers Plaza. It was so empty and sterile compared to any other plaza in any other city, and so people barely used it. Other city plazas were the centerpieces of their respective cities, a sort of synoptic overview of what the city had to offer. If you wanted to move to that city, a good starting point would be to check out its plaza. But to the people who thought about moving to Brasilia, the thing they had to say about it is that it is a city without crowds. Brasilia's plazas were almost always dead, much like the rest of the city. When people returned home from work, they had to walk back to the soul-crushing Super Quadra residentials. No architecture was allowed besides clean white boxes with windows. Compare that with a residential in other parts of Brazil. You can tell it has some sort of local tradition that people design themselves. They weren't created by some elusive state bureaucrat. It is much more human. Like all utopian projects, the city did not run the way its designers had envisioned. By the 1980s, 75% of the population lived in unplanned settlements. The poor people moved to the outside of the city and preferred to live in wooden huts. I guess that was better than living in that white padded cell of a city. While the richer residents stayed in the city, but still created their own settlements with private housing and nightclubs, which is pretty ironic for a city that was planned to be classless. But what went wrong in Brasilia? The same problem with the scientific forests and American street design, using oversimplified maps and designs that only show a few areas of interest, mostly in the realm of perceived efficiency, especially economic efficiency. Brasilia had no sidewalks or pedestrian crossings, so it had almost no traffic problems but it stopped the accidental meeting of a friend or neighbor on the street to gossip, or the spur of the moment decision to go shopping. You were supposed to go to the plaza to meet people, but even if you did meet someone, it would be very inconvenient to go and do something since every district was separated for a distinct purpose. You may have had to go a good 10 miles for a single restaurant or store. And the general sense of sterility from the architecture and the layout of the city made everything seem soulless. When kids were asked to draw houses, they drew traditional family homes, even though they grew up in the super quadras. A combination of all of these caused 75% of the people to live outside the planned areas, and they decided to create their own homes, even if they had to lower their standard of living. This video isn't about why I think the state shouldn't be allowed to plan anything. This isn't some libertarian thing about how literally every little thing the state touches is inherently evil. Well, well, maybe a little bit. But corporations can oversimplify just as bad as the state can by also only looking at a few variables of interest and ignoring the rest due to corner cutting or the subject just being way too complex or ambitious. But there are two differences between a state and a corporation when it comes to planning. One, the state has a monopoly on physical force. So if the state has a utopian vision, they have the muscle to try and force it into reality. And two, a corporation has to financially pay for its failures. No matter how financially terrible a state's decisions are, they will remain in power. You need something like a radical leadership change or a revolution for things to change. State planning can be used for great things like helping the poor get back on their feet or creating a good sewage system for its citizens, but it needs to know its own limits. Creating things that look nice and symmetrical on a map does a great disservice to the world. Most things are super complex and do not look geometrical or simple. The human body, a car engine, a motherboard, atoms, the forest ecology, and especially a properly functioning city can only be changed a limited amount without drastically affecting the millions of tiny and imperceptible symbiotic relationships that each component has with one another. So. Wherever the balance is, 
I hope we can find it.